What's cracking? Big dogs. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to that quarters. My name is Nicholas. This is B D G E. Big dogs got to eat. And the energy in today's video is supplied by Coco's Coffee House on Bleaker. If you're in New York, if you're in, if you're, I got too much energy. I went with a nitro brew today. I got in there so many times. He's like, you want your normal like hot medium roast? I said, fuck that. We got a video to make today. Give me that nitro brew. Sucked it down in about eleven minutes. 11 seconds, 11 fucking kiloseconds. All right, we out here. We're doing a running back rankings video today, as we've done the last 17 videos. I know you guys are sick of the running back rankings video. This will be the last one. Let me know what kind of content you want to see going forward. I've got about 10 or 12 video ideas, and I'm going to start rattling off on the you know Wednesday, Thursday, Friday slate of videos. They're not ranking videos. Those They start to get boring, all right? So uh, the rankings videos are going to stop today. We're going to do running back rankings 19 through 24. So we'll wrap up all of our RB1s, all of our RB2s, and if you missed any of the previous videos, you know, all those running back rankings, those will be linked in the description. Highly, 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 actually mediocrely recommend that you go watch those. Today, we're going to we're gonna wrap up the last of the RB2s. Again, no more rankings videos, but if you want the full extensive list of our rankings for your season-long leagues, those are available in our draft guide. I have not talked about nor plugged our draft guide in a long time because we are undergoing maintenance on the the website and about a week or two into july i want to say july 12th is the hesitant launch date of our draft guide we have started working with a, a real full stack website development agency uh, in which i have a call with right after this video filming and they are fucking amazing and they're really good at what they do and i'm really excited to see what they do for our draft guide website it'll be completely revamped and it'll be beautiful for y'all um, and everything is in the draft guide that you guys need to prepare for your season-long leagues. And if you're in Dynasty Leagues, we got the Dynasty Rookie Guide as well, breaking down every single rookie as well as some other exclusive content and whatnot. So bdge.store if you're interested in getting the rest of the rankings, positional, super flex, whatever, 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 whatever. We're here to talk about running backs today. And we're going to do so right after we tuck our shirts in. We stop yelling. And we eat. As always, fake intern Tony is going to be throwing up on the screen a little chart for each player, which shows our running back ranking, shows the underdog positional ADP, so where they're being drafted right now, the difference in the two, and then the overall underdog ADP in terms of where they're actually getting drafted in the draft, not just running back specific. So number 19, we have David Montgomery of the Chicago Bears. He is currently the 20th running back off the board per ADP, so we're actually one spot higher, and he's going 41st overall, which is about midway through the fourth round if my ti 83 plus calculations are correct which they are never wrong so we look at montgomery he finishes last year as the running back four and a half ppr and if you told me he did that for me in the preseason you'd be drafting him everywhere i would argue that the first half of the season maybe the first like 12 weeks of the season would not have been a good pick but listen not everything can be consistent not everything is black and white not everything is linear okay success is not linear in life nor was it for david montgomery last year but if you owned him down the stretch last year, you likely won your league. Now, you say, why is the RB4 getting picked midway through the fourth round? I think there's a few reasons why, right? I don't think anyone, he was good last year, right? Great down the stretch. I don't think anyone actually believes that the talents of David Montgomery matches where he finished in fantasy football. He's not an elite talent, right? He's not an elite running back. You don't look at him and think Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, you know, guys like that. So that's the first thing, right? You have hesitancy. You have subconscious hesitancy about David Montgomery because we don't, we've been triggered. We've been uh, we've been programmed to believe that he's a bigger running back that's kind of slow when he's not that good in a in an offense that's not very good. That's reason number one. Okay, but when you look back over the last six weeks, the splits are out of control. Okay, last six weeks this season, weeks twelve through seventeen, averaging over. 23, so nearly 24 half PPR fantasy points per game, nearly 26 full PPR fantasy points per game. He was getting four and a half targets per game. It was actually, you know, he was actually uh, even with what he did the first nine weeks of the season in terms of targets. But when you look at the rushing attempts, he got five more rushing attempts. He was averaging 1.2 rushing touchdowns per game. Just, just uh, absurd numbers, almost 140 total yards from scrimmage per game and nearly 1.35 touchdowns per game overall over the last six weeks of the season. Unreal numbers. However, just like we note with Jonathan Taylor, came against some of the worst run defenses in the NFL, right? That schedule from weeks 12 through 17. Green Bay, Detroit, 
Houston, Minnesota, Jacksonville, Green Bay. Okay. Detroit, Houston, and Minnesota were literally the top two worst run defenses in the NFL, as, as well as the fourth worst run defense in the NFL. You should talk about three of the first, three of the top four worst run defenses in the NFL. It was where David Montgomery really broke out. I still think you need to give credit where it's due, right? Every week it felt like we were saying, this is the week that the old David Montgomery comes bike, right? This is the week that David Montgomery returns down to what we thought he was as a prospect or what he did his rookie year, and it just never happened. He even broke away an 80-yard touchdown run at one point, which I didn't think anyone thought was physically possible with his 4-6-3 ass, all right? So David Montgomery did a lot of things, proved us wrong. Who knows what would have happened, though, if Tyree Cohen stayed healthy? That's the big elephant in the room here, right? He's, he's a little guy. I, I, would, I would assume... Uh, an elephant could probably eat like 17 of Tyree Cohen before he, he actually got full. Regardless of the elephant talk, when you look at what Terry Cohen did in his first three years in the league, 71 targets, 91 targets, 104 targets. But more importantly, the actual target share of the, the targets that went to the running backs in Chicago, 52.4 as a rookie, 69.1 in 2018, 75.6% of the running back targets went to Terry Cohen in 2019. Terry Cohen gets hurt in the third week of the 2021 season or the 2020 season, excuse me. And then Demont takes over as the full-time pass catcher. So he takes 59.4% of the targets in the Chicago bike field. And let's, let's be real here, people. Dave Montgomery is not catching 55 passes again this year. He was literally number one in terms of routes run in the running back position in 2020 because uh, Tariq Cohen was gone. He literally saw 89% of the running back opportunities last year. If you're talking about targets plus carries, 89% of them in Chicago's backfield went to David Montgomery. That's that's like peak C-Mac type numbers, okay? That ain't happening again. The only the only players that were there with competition for David Montgomery last year were literally not even running backs. You have kick return quarter rail, and you have Ryan Now, who's Now, however the fuck you say his name. He's a tight end, okay? They didn't even have a real running back. So they bring in Damian Williams, who opted out last year, was very good for the Chiefs two years ago, and they uh, they bring in Khalil Herbert, both of which I think are much better running back options than wh whatever they had last year. I don't think they're going to push David Montgomery for real competition, but they're much better breather backs, and I think Chicago's coaching staff will be more comfortable actually giving them touches when David Montgomery needs to rest a little bit, okay? So you want to talk about the inconsistency with David Montgomery, another red flag for me, is yes, he was awesome down the stretch again last year versus really, really weak defenses, but from weeks 1 through 12, all right, from weeks 1 through 12, David Montgomery Montgomery scored over 12 half PPR fantasy points just twice, okay? That's a long stretch of the season for your RB1 or RB2 to not give you any sort of ceiling games. That's a problem. I think when you look at efficiency-wise, what David Montgomery was last year, he was exactly who we thought he was, right? Breakaway run rate, so the percentage of his runs that went for over 15-plus yards. He doesn't have that breakaway speed. He's not a home run player. 52nd in the NFL. His 2.4% breakaway run rate, so only 2.4% of his runs last year, his carries last year, went for 15-plus yards. So he's not giving you chunk plays. He needs that wild volume in order to make things happen. His true yards per carry, 4.0, was 47th in the NFL. And his juke rate, which is basically his elusive rating, 20.3%, 31st among running backs. So he wasn't particularly elusive. He wasn't making big plays. He just happened to be the guy that got a fuckload of volume last year. So the touch share is not going to happen in 2021. However, I think David Montgomery can be a fine draft pick because you know what you're getting out of him. He is a high floor running back too for sure. And who knows if Justin Fields gets on the field earlier than we expect, this could be a little bit of a better offense. I don't, I don't expect it to be groundbreaking, even if Justin Fields is actually on the field and is the starter under center. But I think uh, at the end of the day, David Montgomery is like an RB2 that you probably prefer. If you're going to be like a playoff team or a league winning team, David Montgomery probably needs to be uh, finish as an RB2 that you have in your flex spot. We'll put it that way. So that's the way I'm looking at him. He's a high floor player. Moving on to number 20. I'm just saying, I'm just saying who says, who says, I'm just saying who says Mike Davis can't outscore Christian McCaffrey in fantasy points again this year. I'm hearing crickets. I'm hearing crickets. Probably because I'm filming by myself in my room. But still crickets nonetheless. We take results over process here. You know, everyone in fantasy football talks about process over results. Fuck that. Give me results 98% of the time, baby. They win every time. Okay, so give me the fucking results. Give me what Mike Davis did last year. He's my running back 20, okay? So the Falcons literally brought in nobody besides Mike Davis to compete at running back, okay? Like, I understand they signed Javion Hawkins, and I'm a fan of Javion Hawkins out of Louisville, but he was an undrafted free agent, people. Everybody was ecstatic. Everyone besides me, I'm, I'm just a sharp. I don't know what else to do here. Everyone, literally every person on earth besides me, was really high on Todd Gurley last year as a third, fourth round pick. Davis has the exact same role as Todd Gurley from last year, except he's healthier. He has two knees. He is a better pass catcher. He has less competition than Gurley did last year. Right? Everybody that uh, the Falcons had in their backfield, Brian Hill, Ito Smith, not good players, but they were competition for Gurley and were taking touches. Um, but Mike Davis has none of that. And he's going around and a half later than Todd Gurley was last year. Mike Davis was legitimately good for Carolina 
um, as both a pass catcher and a runner, right? When you look at the numbers, number eight in overall evaded tackles, number three in juke rate. He did it behind the 61st ranked run blocking line for him per player profile and the sixth highest stacked front rate. 37.6% of the time he had a run, it was against stacked fronts. Sixth highest in the NFL. He had a 15.4% target share, top five among running backs. So he was good volume wise. He was good efficiency wise. Is Mike Davis actually as good as those numbers? Obviously not. He's not a top five running back in the league. He's not a top five talent, but he's better than whatever fucking Todd Gurley was on the field for us last year. Gurley had 17 goal line attempts, okay? Sixth highest number in the NFL. If Mike Davis has that role, which he should, he's going to be a problem for fantasy. So the fact that Mike Davis is currently going off the board, he's my running back 20. His ADP per underdog is running back 22, overall 49. So you're talking about the last pick of the fourth round, first pick of the fifth round. I like him in the fifth round. I really like Mike Davis in the fifth round this year. Again, same role as Todd Gurley, uh, which was, which should have been a very fruitful role if Todd Gurley didn't fucking stink. And they lose Julio Jones. There's no more Dirk Cutter there throwing the ball 70% of the time. I think Davis will be very involved in this offense. He's definitely more of a floor play. I do think he's sort of like a, a David Montgomery, but I think his touch here, I think Mike Davis's touch here or uh, percentage of the opportunities in the backfield will mirror David Montgomery's, if not, you know, surpass it. He might actually have more because he, he'll probably get more targets than David Montgomery will with Tyree Cohen coming bike. So right now, Mike Davis running back 20. I think he's just, again, he's, he's, he's kind of, you know what you're getting there. I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up finishing as like the running back 14 or 15. So it gives you a nice little positive ROI. I'm not shooting for like a ceiling here. He's not going to give you the CMAC numbers because he's going to give you better fucking numbers than CMAC. No, in all seriousness, running back 20, we'll move on to running back 21. Miles Sanders. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck you. I liked Miles Sanders last year. Had his had his line not falling apart. Had his line not falling apart in the preseason. Probably still would have sucked ass, but regardless. Miles Sanders, man. If he didn't get hurt in that 80 yard run against Baltimore, would have been a menace. Would have been a menace. If things broke right. I really I really okay. So on, on a real note, if things broke right for Miles Sanders last year, everything everything went wrong. Got hurt in the preseason, his line got hurt, he got hurt again on the on the long run. Uh he would have been the workhorse for the year. I really believe that. He played in twelve games last year. Played in twelve games, averaged eighteen opportunities a game, including a game where he came out at halftime when he got hurt at the end of the run. 18 opportunities a game is, is easily RB1 numbers in fantasy football. He just couldn't stay healthy though. And now things change a little bit in 2021. Now the Eagles didn't bring in any, any big name backs, but, but they brought a lot of backs in that. And that's the problem. I think that sends a signal in itself. It doesn't necessarily say that someone's going to take over the starting role. I still very much think Miles Sanders is the RB1 in Philadelphia, but it also means there are going to be a lot of guys cycling in and out and taking opportunities from Miles Sanders. And the the part of the, the the scary part about that is we don't know what kind of opportunities are going to be taken from him. We I, I think you can assume Miles Sanders will probably be the early down back. But what happens on third downs? What happens on the goal line? They claim Karyon Johnson off waivers and they bring back Jordan Howard. They draft Kenneth Gainwell. Uh, they still have Boston. And Scott in the backfield. I think it's showing a clear message. And if you're not getting the message, then they literally fucking told us the message. Okay. Uh, Eagles running backs coach Jamal Singleton downplayed the idea of an every down back. It all depends on your room. Singleton said you need a first and second down runner with that really elite ability. That's probably him referencing Miles Sanders. You need a guy that can pass protect on third down and be short yardage. That could be Jordan Howard. You need a back that can run routes and you can put him out in empty. It's really a combination of that. I think the days of he's in every down back, that's a little skewed these days because of the speed, because of the contact. So that becomes an issue when your coach is already talking about using a ton of backs. He's fucking telling you that they're going to be using a ton of backs. He's telling us that he it's going to be a committee. So don't be surprised when it is. When week one rolls around and they put Jordan Howard in on the goal line, you can't say we didn't fucking tell you. We can't say we didn't warn you here, okay? Sanders has that home run ability to hit the massive touchdowns, and I'm sure he'll have a, a, he'll have a few of those. Maybe it happens in week one. Everyone's like, it shouldn't have faded Miles Sanders this year. But we don't know what his pass game involvement is going to be. He was really bad on third downs last year. He was not good in the passing game despite a strong rookie year. Uh, so who knows if he reclaims that role because Kenneth Gainwell is a pass catching specialist. He's very good in the receiving game. I was not high on Kenneth Gainwell coming in as a runner pre NFL draft. And then he dropped to the fifth round and I was even lower on him, but I'm not denying that he's a really, really, really good pass catching weapon out of the backfield. Is he going to be the goal? Is he going to be the goal line back? That's the other question. That's the other valuable question here in this offense. You look back at last year, Jordan Howard had nine goal line carries. Miles Sanders had 10. So you had Jordan Howard had one fewer, but he played in five fewer games than Miles Sanders did. And then you also have Jalen Hurts, a mobile quarterback. Maybe he has the Josh Allen effect. Maybe he has the Lamar Jackson effect where he's taking a lot of the carries on the goal line. That hurts from Miles Sanders' pockets a little bit too. So we don't have the answer to that, man. The, the positives for Miles Sanders are that the offensive line should be much healthier. They're getting a lot of pieces back. And Jalen Hurts will be under center, which will help him efficiency-wise, right? His splits in the three games where Jalen Hurts was the full-time starter 
for Philly last year, you could you could see that the uh, efficiency and the volume numbers were up. He averaged more receptions. He averaged more rushing attempts. He averaged more touchdowns, more rushing yards, more receiving yards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I still think trying to extrapolate a small sample size instead of just reading what the coaching staff is already telling us is what we should be doing here. And you might say, oh, why didn't you just fucking do that last year? Well, last year we went into the, into the year, them telling us that Miles Sanders was going to be the workhorse. And then the first three weeks of the season, when he finally got, he missed week one, when he was back, he got like 27 opportunities, 26 opportunities, 28 opportunities. Like he was a workhorse. They told him what they were going to, they told us what they were going to do with him. But the rest of the team was just in fucking shambles. So he wasn't good. He wasn't efficient on those, on those touches. This year, they're telling us that they're going to be using a committee. So I think we should probably fucking take that into consideration. Okay. Now, Sanders is very risky. I admit that. And uh, I think he's better off being viewed as a low-end RB2, if not a flex play this year. That's the way I look at Sanders, okay? We could talk about how, like, all these guys are ranked as RB2, but that you don't want a low-end RB2 being your actual RB2. That's not how you win fantasy leagues. You need a high-end RB2 to be your RB2, or you need two RB1s in your lineup and then RB like low-end RB2s in your flex play. That's how you win fantasy leagues, okay? So when you're when you're drafting and you're like, oh, don't worry, I'll just grab Miles Sanders as my RB2, if he finishes as a low-end RB2, that's not good return on investment. You need to be above average on all the positions that you have. If you have your RB1, you need an above average RB1. If you have an RB2 in your RB2 slot, you need an above average RB2. You can't just be settling for the RB11 in your RB1 role and then the RB22 in your RB2 role. We need to be above average on everybody. So look at Miles Sanders as a low-end RB2 that you'd rather have in your flex. Another flex option is Josh Jacobs of the Las Vegas Raiders. I feel like the hate on Josh Jacobs has actually gone a little bit too far. He, he continually drops down. He is our 22nd ranked running back. He is 21 per underdog ADP. He's going 44th overall. So also end-ish of the fourth round. So that's like the 4-8, I want to say, 408, 409. So you can get him at the back end of the fourth round, which I've got a, a, a decent amount of shares of Josh Jacobs there. Uh, listen, like he's probably never going to be the pass catcher that we hoped that we would see there in Las Vegas and what we saw in college on an efficiency basis, because he's very good when he's catching passes and running routes and whatnot. But I don't I, I think people are looking at him as if he's going to be like a total flop. I think he's a very high floor running back two in, in 2021. I mean, the dude had over 300 touches last year. I don't see why he can't touch the ball 250 times again this year. Now they bring in Kenyon Drake, obviously. They bring in Kenyon Drake. They gave him a lot of money. They gave him 11 million million dollars guaranteed over the next two years so that tells me that he's going to be a part of the offense of course last year there were 189 non-josh Jacobs running back touches in las vegas ken drake's going to get a lot of those will he get all those no will some will some of the touches that josh Jacobs was it going to get go to Kenyon drake sure so i don't expect jacobs to get 300 plus touches i still do expect him to be in the mid 200 you know if not upper 200 touch range like 200 40 to 260, somewhere in that range. I know you're going to say the offensive line is a shit show and they got rid of all their pieces, and they did. They got rid of Trent Brown. They got rid of Rodney Hudson, which is going to hurt them. I'm going to be honest, though. Last year, they were already a terrible offensive line. Like They were 27th in run blocking per PFF. If you're going to hold that, that their offensive line is going to be bad against them this year, like they were already bad last year, okay? So it can't get much worse than 27th in run blocking per uh, per the PFF grade. So they're, they're, it, listen, it's not an exciting pick, but he's not, he's not going to be as bad as people are making him out to be. So he was a player that in the beginning of the spring, beginning of the summer, Josh Jacobs was going in like the third round. And I was like, that's a terrible pick, of course. But now he's dropping. He dropped from the third round to the fourth round, to the end of the fourth round. I'm sure he'll be like early fifth round by the time real drafts come around. And I'm okay with that because you're getting volume. You're getting, uh, he's going to be your fifth pick, your whatever, uh, midway through the fifth round. And you're going to be able to put him into your flex spot. And who knows? Like he he got a ton of goal line carries last year. Uh, he was third in the NFL in goal line carries last year. I think he still has that role. So you give me someone who gets a little bit of touchdown luck, 250 touches plus eight to nine uh, touchdown scores. That's going to be a fine flex play for you. So I like Josh Jacobs. I, I kind of look at him as like what Todd Gurley was last year for the Falcons, and you're getting him two rounds later. So I like Josh Jacobs here. 23rd is Miles Gaskin. If you're going to be a fan of Miles Gaskin, don't throw a fucking S at the end of his name. I'm allowed to do it because I'm not really a fan of Miles Gaskin, okay? Look at the situation in Miami. Subjectively, like I said, I'm not in love with him. I just find it really hard to believe that Miles Gaskin is the guy all season in Miami. They have a new offensive coordinator. They brought in Malcolm Brown. Um, we also know the Dolphins were next in line in waiver priority to get Karan Johnson had the Eagles not grabbed him. And they were basically linked to every single free agent running back, Aaron Jones, Chris Carson, Leonard Fournette. Um, even Le'Veon Bell, and then linked to like every rookie running back that was drafted this year. Now they didn't, they didn't. So I can't hold that against them because they did not sign anybody, they did not draft anybody. But I just think it's worth noting, objectively, objectively, right? These are all my subjective takes, but objectively, they used him a ton last year. Miles Gaskin played in ten games 
and averaged over 18 touches a game. It's a big, it's a big check in the asset department that we know if he's on the field, he's getting those touches. And when Gaskin was out, Salvin Ahmed took a lot of touches. It seems like they want to use one, one back, or at least last year they did. I have a hard time buying into that for 2021 though, with all, with, with what we've heard and what they've done this off season. The other thing to note is like Miles Gaskin is 205 pounds. Okay. Gaskin is 205 pounds. He only played in 10 games. Is that to say they gave him the feature workload? They gave him the big workload and then he couldn't stay healthy? Like that could be a problem. Maybe they saw that as a problem. We also, you know, it's Brian Flores. He's coming over, came over from New England and he saw what they did all this year. So I wouldn't be surprised if this turned into somewhat of a committee. Um, but w- what I do see is Miles Gaskin can be like an Austin Eckler light. He was really, really good in the passing game last year. Target share, number eight in the NFL, 13.4%. Yards per reception, number one among running backs. Yards per outrun, number three among running backs. Catch rate, number three uh, among running backs. So, at the end of the day, I just see Gaskin is probably like a third down back who will get some early down work. I, I think Malcolm Brown is going to piss you off on the goal line. I think he's going to get a lot of goal line carries. I expect Gaskin carry numbers to dip between like the 8 and 10 range with still getting passing work, which is why he's a low-end RB2 for me. Um, I just don't think the upside that people are thinking he might get is actually there. I, I don't see any any chance that Miles Gaskin is the workhorse for Miami for the entire season, whether he doesn't hold up, whether he misses more time with ankle injuries or whatever. Um, I just don't see it happening. So he's down at 23 for me. He's not a guy that I'm necessarily... He is kind of a guy that I'm fading right now at his ADP, which is, let's see, he is 24th off the board for underdog running backs. He is 57th overall. So you're getting him in the fifth round. I don't think that's a terrible draft spot, but it's kind of in the dead zone. And I, I could see us looking back and being like, Miles Gaskin was like the easiest fade in the dead zone for running backs. Someone who's an easier fade for me the Miles Gaskin is Travis Etienne of the Jaguars, man. He is currently uh, one spot ahead of Gaskin. So he is the running back 23 per underdog ADP, 51st overall. So you're getting him at the end of the fourth, early fifth round. I've just said it 90 times. I've talked about ETN so much. It's he just seems like every workhorse running back that we've seen or every every running back that we've seen these smaller ish type of running backs that we want to be forced into a workhorse role off the rip. You know, it was Miles Sanders, it was DeAndre Swift, Cam Akers, J.K. Dobbins. It just doesn't happen. The only running backs that that tends to happen to are the big workhorse types that are going into a situation where we know they're the clear ones, right? It was Zeke, it was Leonard Fournette, it was it's Najee Harris this year. Like we know what the volume is going to be. But every time we have a talented running back that gets good draft capital that's going into a weird situation, it always takes them a long time to settle into the touches. Like Travis Etienne, listen, week 10 through week 17 this year, he might be great. Um, But is it worth using a fourth round pick on a guy that you can't use for the first two, three months of the season? Probably not. James Robinson coming off of one of the best rookie seasons by a running back, relatively speaking, of all time. The level of volatility that I think we're going to get from Etienne is going to be maddening. And I don't know. I just, I just, along with everybody else, don't trust Urban Meyer to do the right. I don't, I don't trust him to do something besides using him as like a weird fucking weapon. I want him to be a running back. I want him to be a first round running back. And that's what they did. So listen, objectively, you look at what running backs did uh, that are first round picks. And I wanted to go back because I, I've, I push the narrative a lot that first round running backs get a ton of touches, but there's a difference between a top 10 running back and then a running back pick. 25th overall at the end of the first round. So I went back over the last 20 years, dating back to the year 2000, first round running backs average 14.1 touches per game in their rookie season. Running backs in the top. So 14.1, the average first round running back over the last 20 years averages 14.1 touches per game in their rookie season. Running backs in the top half of the first round. So you're talking about if they were running back picked from pick one through 16 in the actual NFL draft, averaged 16.9 touches per game. A little more work. 14.1 for the overall first first round running back. 16.9 if they were in the first half of the first round. If you go to the second half of the first round, running back 17 through 32, those guys average 11.7 touches per game during their rookie season. I feel like that's exactly what we should expect from Travis Etienne during his rookie season. The numbers say that that's what we're going to get. I think between 11 and 14 touches per game. I just don't, I, I, I find it so hard. Like I can't close my eyes and envision games where Travis Etienne is getting 18 carries a game, 22 carries a game. I just I just don't see it happening. 11 to 14 touches seems very reasonable. Is he going to catch? Is he going to have games where he catches four, five, six, seven passes? Yes, I definitely think that's in his range of outcomes. I definitely think we're going to see a lot of that. So if you're in a full PPR league, you're obviously going to like Etienne a little bit more. But again, like with all these low-end RB2s, we don't know the exact situation. We don't know, like Miles Sanders, who's going to be in on the goal line. Is James Robinson going to be in on the goal line? He's bigger than Travis Etienne is. He played a lot last year and he was on the goal line a lot last year. Um, You also look at, again, Trevor Lawrence, very mobile quarterback. Does he have the Josh Allen effect on this? Does he take goal line carries away from a guy like Travis Etienne? Probably won't be getting them in the first place. So I just see a ton of red flags here who outside of a full PPR league, I have a really, really hard time pulling the trigger on a guy that I'm projecting for like 11 to 12 touches 
per game uh, as a rookie. Maybe second half of the season, you trade for him or something, but fourth round draft capital and fantasy this year for Travis Etienne seems like the easiest fucking fade, the easiest stay away, the easiest, the easiest fucking nitro brew to blow up in your face. All right, y'all. That is running backs 19 through 24. That is the full 1 through 24. If you've missed any of the previous three running back rankings videos, they will be linked in the description. You can go watch them now. If you want the full season-long rankings available probably at the beginning of next week on the website, go cop it. BDGE.store. BDGE.store. It's, uh, it's where you can cop the draft guides. It's where you can become a Patreon. It's where you can cop some, some merchy merch from us. Um, but thank you for joining us. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll be doing fantasy football videos every day of the week until your drafts and through the season. Like the video if you liked the video. Comment down below what kind of comment, what kind of content y'all want to see going forward. That's it. I'm out here.